one, or the most real subject of modern diffuse cynicism. Quoting Martin Heidegger's Sein on Sight, with respect to this everyday way of being, it may not be superfluous to say that interpretation has a purely ontological intention, and is far from being a moralizing critique of everyday existence, or from having cultural philosophical aspirations. Another quote from the same source. Life is a business, regardless of whether it covers its costs or not. An advertising slogan from the United States. Why live when for as little as $10 you can be buried? Anyone, the non-person in our cabinet of cynics, reminds one in its meagre form of jointed figures used by graphic artists for position studies and anatomical sketches. However, the position that Heidegger had his eye on is, is, is an indefinite one. He eavesdrops on the subject and the banality of the everyday mode of being. The existential ontology which treats anyone and its existence in everydayness attempts something that would not have occurred even in a dream to earlier philosophy. To transform triviality into an object of higher theory. This of itself is a gesture this of itself is a gesture that inevitably leads us to suspect Heidegger of kinicism. What critics of the Heideggerian existential ontology have cited as its mistake is perhaps its critical point. It elevates the art of platitudes into the heights of the explicit concept. One could read his ontology as an inverted satire that does not drag down what is high, but raises what is low. It tries to say what is self-evident so explicitly and thoroughly that even intellectuals by rights would have to understand it. In a certain regard, a logical Eulenspiegel game on a grand scale is hidden in Heidegger's discourse, with its scurrilous refinements and conceptual nuances. The attempt to translate mystically simple knowledge about simple life as it is into the most advanced tradition of European thinking. Heidegger's posture of a black forest peasant who, withdrawn from the world, likes to sit and brood in his hut, cap on his head. It's no mere external detail. It belongs to the essence of this kind of philosophizing. It contains the same ambitious plainness. It shows just how mischievous it really It shows just how much mischievousness it really takes under modern conditions to say something so simple and primitive that it can be accepted in the face of the complex convolutions of enlightened consciousness. We read Heidegger's statements about anyone, existence, design, and everydayness, about talk, ambiguity, fallenness, and thrownness, Gewürfenheit, etc., against the background of the preceding portraits of Mephisto and the Grand Inquisitor, as a series of etudes and a higher banality with which philosophy feels its way into that which is really the case. It is precisely by doing away with the myth of objectivity that Heidegger's existential hermeneutical analysis produces the hardest depth positivism. A philosophy thus appears that participates ambivalently in a disillusioned, secularised and technicised zeitgeist. It thinks from beyond good and evil, and from a side of metaphysics, from this side of metaphysics. It can move only along this thin line. 
the theoretical neokinicism of our century, existentialist philosophy, demonstrates in its form of thinking the adventure of banality. What it presents is the fireworks of meaninglessness that begins to understand itself. We have to clarify for ourselves the contemptuous phrase with which Heidegger, in the motto cited earlier, strongly distances his work from any moralising critique, as if he wanted to emphasise that contemporary thinking has left the swamps of moralism behind once and for all, and no longer has anything in common with cultural philosophy. The latter can be nothing more than an aspiration, vain pretension, grandiose thinking, and Weltanschauung in the style of the 19th century, which never wanted to come to an end. By contrast, in the purely ontological intention, the burning coolness of real modernity is at work, which no longer needs any mere enlightenment, and which has already been through every possible analytic critique. Laying bare the structure of existence by thinking ontologically, by speaking positively. To this end, Heidegger, in order to avoid the subject object terminology, throws himself with commendable linguistic mischievousness into an alternative jargon that, viewed from a distance, is certainly no more felicitous than what he wanted to avoid, in whose innovativeness, however, Something of something of the adventure of modern primitivistness, modern primitiveness shines through. A linking of the archaic with modern times, a reflection of the earliest and the latest. The explicitness of Heideggerian speech expresses what philosophy otherwise does not find worth speaking about. Precisely in that moment when thinking, explicitly nihilistic, recognises meaninglessness as the foil of every possible statement or attribution of meaning. The highest unfolding of hermeneutics, i.e. the art of understanding meaning, becomes necessary in order to articulate philosophically the meaning of meaninglessness. That according to the reader's background, can be as stimulating as it is frustrating. A circling around in conceptualised emptiness. A shadow play of reason. What is this rare being that Heidegger introduces under the name of anyone? At first glance it resembles modern sculptures that do not represent any definite object and whose polished surfaces do not admit of any particular meaning. Still, they are immediately real and firm to the touch. In this sense, Heidegger emphasises that anyone is no abstraction, roughly a general concept that comprises all egos. Instead, he wants us to relate to it as ens realissimum, to something that is present in every one of us. But it disappoints the expectation of personalness, individual purport, and existentially decisive meaning, and existentially decisive meaning. It exists, but there is nothing behind it. It is there like modern non-figure sculptures, real, everyday, concrete part of the world, but not referring at any time to an actual person. A real meaning. Anyone is the neutrum of our ego, everyday ego, but not I myself. It represents in a certain way my public side, my mediocrity. I have anyone in common with everyone else. It is my public ego, and in relation to it, averageness is always in the right. As an authentic ego, anyone disposes of any highly personalised decisiveness. Entschiedenheit. Entschiedenheit? Of its own. By nature it wants to make everything easy for itself. To take everything from the outside and to abide by conventional appearances. 
In a certain respect, it also behaves in this way towards itself. For what it is, its self, it also accepts. Just like something it finds among other things that are simply givens. This anyone can thus only be understood as something non-autonomous, which has nothing of itself or solely for itself. What it is, is said and given by others. That explains its essential distractedness. Zur Streutheit. Zur Streutheit? Indeed, it remains lost to the world that it at first encounters. Again, quoting Sein und Zeit. At first, I am not in the sense of one's own self, but the others in the modus of anyone, from the latter and as the latter. At first I am given my self. At first, existence, design, is anyone, and mostly it remains so. As anyone, I always live under the inconspicuous domination of the others, Everyone is the other, and no one is himself. The anyone is nobody. This description of anyone, with which Heidegger makes it possible to speak about the ego, without having to do so in the style of subject-object philosophy, works like a retranslation of the expression subject into the vernacular, where it means the subjugated one. Those who are subjugated think that they no longer possess themselves. Not even the language of anyone says anything of its own, but only participates in the universal talk. Gerede. Discourse. Gerede. In talk, in which one says the things that one says, anyone closes itself off from really understanding its own existence, as well as that of the things talked about. In talk, the uprootedness, Entwurzelung, and the inauthenticity, Uneigentlichkeit, of everyday existence reveal themselves. To it corresponds the curiosity that fleetingly and incessantly gives itself up to whatever is newest. The curious anyone, insofar as it also undertakes communication, is never really after genuine understanding, but its opposite, avoidance of insight, evasion of the authentic person in existence. Heidegger expresses this avoidance through the concept of distraction, Zerstreuung, an expression that makes one prick up one's ears, even though everything up to this point tried to sound thoroughly timeless and universally valid, we know at once with this word at which point in modern history we stand. No other word is so saturated with the specific taste of the mid-twenties, of the first German modernity on a large scale. Everything we have heard about anyone could be in the final analysis inconceivable without the precondition of the Weimar Republic, with its hectic post-war life feeling, its mass media, its Americanism, its entertainment and culture industry, its advanced system of distraction. Only in the cynical, demoralised and demoralising climate of a post-war society, in which the dead are not allowed to die, because from their downfall political capital is to be made, can an impulse be diverted out of the zeitgeist into philosophy, to observe existence existentially, and to place everything in opposition to authentic, consciously derided existence as a being unto death. Only after the military Gutterdammerung, after the disintegration of values, and the coincidentia oppositorum, on the fronts of the material war, where good and evil dispatch each other into the beyond, did such a critical reflection on authentic being become possible. 
In this period, for the first time, attention is drawn in a radical way to the inner socialization. The period senses that reality is dominated by spooks, imitators, remote-controlled ego machines. Each person could be a double, Wiedergänger, instead of itself. But how can one recognize this? And whom can one still see whether it is itself or only anyone? The question stimulates an existentialist's deep cares about the important but impossible distinction between the genuine and the non-genuine, the authentic and the inauthentic, the articulated and the inarticulated, the decided and the undecided, which is simply as it is. Quoting Zeit und Zeit again, Everything looks as though it is genuinely understood, comprehended and said, but basically it is not, or it does not look as though it is, but basically it is. Language, it seems, laboriously keeps what merely looks like, apart from what really is so. But experience shows how everything becomes obscured. Everything looks as if. The philosopher worries about this, as if. For the positivist, everything would be as it is. No difference between essence and appearance. That would only be the old metaphysical spook again with whom one wants nothing more to do. But Heidegger insists on a difference and holds fast to the other, which is not only as if, but has the essential, genuine, authentic in itself. The metaphysical residue in Heidegger and his resistance against pure positivism are revealed in the will to authenticity, Willen zur Eigentlichkeit. There is still another dimension, even if it evades demonstration because it does not belong to the realm of demonstrable things. The other can initially be asserted only by simultaneously averring that it looks precisely like the one, seen from the outside. The authentic does not distinguish itself from the inauthentic in any way. In this remarkable figure of thought, the highest degree of alertness of mind of the twenties pulsates. It postulates a difference that must be made. Though, it cannot be ascertained in any way. As long as ambivalence is at least still asserted as a fundamental feature of existence, the possibility of the other dimension remains formally salvaged. With this, Heidegger's movement of thought, Denk Bewegung, seems to already exhaust itself. In a formal salvaging of the authentic, which of course can look exactly like the inauthentic. But mere assertions are not enough. Ultimately, the much entreated authentic existence requires something special for itself in order to be somehow distinguished. How we are to find it remains the question for the time being. In order to make things really exciting, Heidegger emphasizes on top of it all the habituatedness, the Fallenheit, of existence, as anyone in the world is not a fall from some kind of higher or original state, but rather the existence is all along, already always, habituated. With dry irony, Heidegger remarks that anyone lulls itself into thinking that it leads a genuine, full life when it throws itself unreservedly into worldly goings-on. On the contrary, it is precisely in that that he recognises habituatedness. It must be admitted that the author of Zeit und Zeit knows how to torture the reader, who impatiently awaits the authentic and let us be frank it is a torture by means of a pronounced deep platitude he leads us fantastically explicitly through the labyrinthine gardens of a positive negativity 
he speaks about anyone and its talk, its curiosity, its degeneratedness into the goings-on in brief of alienation. But he assures us in the same breath that all this is established without a trace of moral critique. Rather, all this is supposed to be an analysis with ontological intent. And whoever speaks of anyone is by no means describing a downtrodden self, but a quality of existence that originates simultaneously with authentic being as self. That is how it is from the beginning. And the expression alienation, oddly enough, does not refer back to an earlier, higher, essential, authentic being without estrangement. Alienation, we learn, does not mean that existence has been wrenched from its self, but rather that the inauthenticity of this alienation is from the start the most powerful and the most primitive mode of being of existence. In existence there is nothing that, in an evaluative sense, could be called bad, negative or false. Alienation is simply the mode of being of anyone. Let us try to make the unique choreography of these leaps in thought clear. Heidegger pushes the labour of thinking, which strives towards realistic sobriety beyond the most advanced positions of the 19th century. If the previous grand theories only had the power for realism when they possessed a utopian or moral counterweight for balance. Heidegger now extends nihilism to include the utopian moral area. If the typical pairings of the 19th century were liaisons between theoretical science and practical idealism, realism and utopianism, Objectivism and mythology. Heidegger now sets about a second liquidation of metaphysics. He proceeds to a radical secularization of ends. Without much ado, he notes the unquestionable freedom from ends, characteristic of life and its inauthenticity. I apologise, let me read that again. Without much ado, he notes the unquestionable freedom from ends. Characteris characteristic of life in its authenticity. We do not at all move towards radiant goals, and we are not commissioned by any authority to suffer today for a great tomorrow. Also, with regard to the ends, one needs to think beyond good and evil. The distinction between authentic and inauthentic seems more puzzling than it really is. So much is clear from the beginning. It cannot be the difference in a thing. Beautiful, ugly, true, false, good, evil, great, small, important, unimportant. Because the existential analysis operates prior to these differences. Thus, the last conceivable difference remains that between decided and undecided existence. I would like to say between conscious and unconscious existence. However, the opposition between conscious and unconscious should not be understood in the sense of psychological enlightenment. The undertone of decided undecided points more in the direction intended. Conscious and unconsciousness here are not cognitive oppositions, or oppositions in information, knowledge or science, but existential qualities. If it were otherwise, the Heideggerian pathos of authenticity would not be possible. The construction of the authentic, finally, results in the theorem of being unto death, for Heidegger's critics an excuse for the cheapest kind of outrage. Bourgeois philosophy can no longer work itself up to anything more than morbid thoughts on death. Ash Wednesday fantasies and parasitic heads. There is an element of truth in such a critique when it says that Heidegger's work, contrary to its intention, reflects the historical social moment in which it was written. Even though it claims to be ontological analysis, it provides an unintended theory of the present. 
to the extent that it is involuntarily such a theory, the critics are probably justified in pointing out an unfree, indeed deluded, side to it. But that does not mean that they should not also properly assess its inspired side. No thought is so intimately embedded in its time as that of being unto death. It is the philosophical keyword in the age of imperialist and fascist world wars. Heidegger's theory falls in the breathing space between the First and the Second World Wars. The First and the Second Modernization of Mass Death. It stands midway between the first triumvirate of the destruction industry, Flanders, Tannenberg, Verdun, and the second, Stalingrad, Auschwitz, Hiroshima. Without death industry, no distraction industry. If Sein und Zeit is read not merely as existential ontology, but also as an encoded social psychology of modernity, insights into structural relations open up, offering a tremendous perspective. Heidegger has captured the connection between modern inauthenticity of existence and modern fabrication of death in a way that is accessible only to a contemporary of industrial world wars. If we break the spell cast by the suspicion of fascism on Heidegger's work, explosive critical potentials are disclosed in the formula being unto death. It then becomes understandable that Heidegger's theory of death harbours the greatest critique of this century. It then becomes understandable that Heidegger's theory of death harbours the greatest critique by this century of the last namely, the best theoretical energies of the 19th century, went into the attempt to make the deaths of others unthinkable by means of realistic, grand theories. The great evolutionist designs lifted the evil in the world, insofar as it affected others, into the higher state of later, fulfilled times. Here there are formal equivalences between the idea of evolution the concept of revolution, the concept of selection, the struggle for existence and the survival of the fittest, the idea of progress and the myth of race. In all these concepts, an optics is tested out that objectifies the downfall of others. With Heidegger's theory of death, 20th century thinking turns its back on these hybrid, theoretically neutralised cynicisms of the past century. Viewed superficially, only the personal pronoun is altered. One dies becomes I die. In conscious being unto death, oh, pardon me, in conscious being unto death, Heideggerian existence revolts against the constant reassurance about death, on which an excessively destructive society inevitably relies. The total militarism of industrial war forces in everyday circumstances a narcotic repression of death that has a few loopholes as possible, or the deflection of death onto others. That is the law of modern distraction. The world situation is such that it whispers to people, if they are attentive. Your annihilation is merely a question of time, and the time that it takes to reach you is simultaneously the time of your distraction. The coming annihilation indeed presupposes your distraction, your undecidedness to live. The distracted anyone is the mode of our existing, through which we ourselves are struck in the universal contexts of death and cooperate with the death industry. I want to maintain that Heidegger holds the beginning of the thread to a philosophy of armament in his hands, for armament means to subjugate oneself to the law of anyone. One of the most impressive sentences in Sein und Zeit reads, Anyone does not allow the courage to fear death to rise up. 
those who arm themselves substitute the courage to fear one's own death by military activity. The military is the best guarantor that I do not have to die my own death. It promises me help in the attempt to repress the I die so that I can put in its place an anyone death, a death in absentia, a death in political inauthenticity and anaesthesia. One arms, one distracts oneself, one dies. In Heidegger's I Die, I find the crystallisation point round which a real philosophy is a, um, of a rejuvenated kinesism can develop. No end in the world may ever remove itself so far from this kinical a priori, I Die that our deaths become the means to an end. The meaninglessness of life, about which so much stupid nihilistic prattle winds itself, in fact provides the foundation for its full preciousness. Not only despair and the nightmare of an oppressive existence are attributed to what is meaningless, but also a celebration of life that endows meaning, energetic consciousness in the here and now, and oceanic festival. That when Heidegger himself, uh, that with Heidegger himself things proceed more gloomily, and that his existential scenery unfolds between the nuances and grey of everydayness. <coughs> Excuse me, just a little Rona there. <coughs> what was I saying? That with Heidegger himself things proceed more gloomily, and that his existential scenery unfolds between the nuances and grey of everydayness, and the glaring flashes of fear and the colours of death is well known, and explains the melancholy nimbus of his work. But even in the pathos of being unto death, a grain of chemical substance can be discovered, for it is a pathos of asceticism, and in this pathos, the kinicism of ends can make itself heard in a language of the 20th century. What society prescribes for us ends in its process, already binds us to inauthentic existence. What society prescribes for us as ends in its process, already binds us to inauthentic existence. The world process does everything to repress death, Whereas authentic existence is ignited only when I alertly recognise how I stand in the world. Eye to eye with the fear of death that makes itself felt when, in advance, I radically carry through the thought that I am the one whom, at the end of my time, my death awaits. Heidegger concludes from this an original, eerie, unhomeliness, unheimlichkeit of existence. The world can never become the secure and security endowing home of human beings, because existence from the start is unhomely. The unhoused human being, who above all in philosophy after the Second World War wandered through the devastated country, feels an urge to flee into artificial dwelling places and homes and to withdraw out of fear into habits and habitats. Of course, such statements, although intended to have universal validity, have a concrete connection to the phenomena of their historical moment. Pardon me. Not for nothing is Heidegger a contemporary of the Bauhaus, of new living, of early urbanism, state housing, the theory of settlement, and the first rural communes. His philosophical discourse surreptitiously draws on the modern problematics of feeling towards one's domicile, of the myths of the house and the city. When he talks of the unhousedness, unbehoustheit, of human beings, this idea is nourished not only by the horror that the incorrigible provincial feels toward modern forms of urban life. It amounts to a rejection 
of the house building, city building utopia of our civilization. Socialism really means, insofar as it must affirm industry, an extension of the urban spirit of utopia. It promises to lead us out of the inhospitableness of the cities. However, it proposes to use urban means and envisages a new city, the ultimate humane city and home. Thus, in socialism of this type, there is always a dream partially nourished by urban misery. Heidegger's provincialism has no understanding for this. He views the city with the eyes of an eternal provincial, who cannot be conceived that there could ever be something better to take place of the country. To take the place of the country. Heidegger, as the well-meaning interpreter may say, breaks through modern fantasies about space in which the city dreams of the country and the country of the city. Both fantasies are equally restricted and equally distorted. Heidegger carries out, in part literally, in part metaphorically, a post-historical return to the country. Precisely in the years of the most desolate modernization, the so-called Golden Twenties, the city, once the site of utopia, begins to lose its magic. Berlin especially, the principal city of the early 20th century, played its part in plunging the euphoria of the metropolis into a disenchanted light. As the focal point of industry, production, consumption and mass misery, it is at the same time the most exposed to alienation. Nowhere is modernity paid for so dearly as in the mass cities. The vocabulary of Heidegger's anyone analysis seems especially well suited to express the discontent of developed cities in their own form of life. Culture of distraction, talk, curiosity, unhousedness, habituatedness, one can think here of all sorts of vices, homelessness, fear, being unto death, all that sounds like the misery of the city, captured in a mirror that is somewhat cloudy and somewhat too subtle. Heidegger's provincial kinicism has a marked cultural critical contendency. But it not only attests to a hopeless provincialism when a philosopher of his stature takes leave of the bourgeois urban and socialist utopias, but points to a cynical turn in the space. A cynical turn in the sense that it abrogates the great goals and projections of urban social space. The turn of the province can also be a turn to real macro history that more closely attends to the regulation of life and the framework of nature, agriculture and ecology than all previous industrial world images could. History written by an industrial historian would necessarily become micro-history. The history of the country knows the pulse of a much greater temporality. Reduced to short formulas, the city is not the fulfilment of existence, nor are the goals of industrial capitalism, nor scientific progress, nor more civilization, more cinema, more home beautiful, longer vacations, better eating. None of these things is the fulfilment of existence. What is authentic will always be something else. You must know who you are. You must consciously experience being unto death as the highest instance of your potentiality. It attacks you when you are afraid, when the moment has come when you are courageous enough to hold your ground in the face of the great fear. Quoting Zeit und Zeit again, Authentic fear is rare under the hegemony of habituatedness and the public sphere. Those who choose what is rare make an elitist choice. Authenticity is thus, according to Heidegger, a matter for the few. What is that reminiscent of? Do we not hear again the Grand Inquisitor as he distinguishes between the few and the many? The few who bear the burden of great freedom, and the many who want to live as rebellious slaves and are not prepared to encounter real freedom, real fear, real being. This completely apolitically intended elitism, which assumes an elite of those who really exist, had to slide almost inevitably into the social and guide political opinions. 
In this, the Grand Inquisitor possessed the advantage of an undeceived and cynical political consciousness. Heidegger, by contrast, remained naive. Without a clear awareness that the traditional mixture of academic apoliticism, elitist consciousness, and heroic attitude leads, almost with blind necessity, to unforeseen political decisions. For a time he, one would like to say therefore, fell into the cynicism of the populist Grand Inquisitor. His analysis proved to be true inadvertently about him himself. Everything looks as if. It sounds as if it has been really understood, grasped and spoken, but basically it is not. National Socialism. Movement, uprising, decision, seems to resemble Heidegger's vision of authenticity, decisiveness and heroic being unto death, as if fascism were the birth, rebirth of authenticity out of habituatedness, as if this modern revolt against modernity were the real proof of an existence that had resolutely decided for itself. One has to think of Heidegger when one cites Hannah Arendt's sublime remark about those intellectuals in the Third Reich who, to be sure, were not fascists, but let something occur to them on the theme of National Socialism. In fact, Heidegger let many things occur to him until he noticed what the case authentically was with this political movement. The delusion could not last long. The Nazi movement was supposed to clarify what the populist anyone has up its sleeve, anyone as master human, anyone as simultaneously narcissistic and authoritarian mass, anyone as murderer for pleasure and official responsible for killing. The authenticity of fascism its sole authenticity, consisted in transforming latent destructiveness into manifest destructiveness, thereby participating in a highly contemporary way in the cynicism of open expressiveness that no longer conceals anything. Fascism, especially in its German version, is the unconcealment of political destructiveness, reduced to its most naked form and encouraged by the formula of the will to power. It happened as if Nietzsche, in the manner of a psychotherapist, had said to capitalist society, basically you're all consumed by a will to power, so let it out openly for once and confess to being what you are in any case. Whereupon the Nazis in fact proceeded to let it out. Not under therapeutic conditions, however but in the middle of political reality. It was perhaps Nietzsche's theoretical recklessness that allowed him to believe that philosophy can exhaust itself in provocative diagnoses, without, at the same time, thinking seriously about therapy. The devil can be called by his real name only by those who know of an antidote to him. To name him, whether as will to power, as aggression, etc., is to acknowledge his reality, and to acknowledge this reality is to unleash it. Since Heidegger, there is another offspring of the ancient clinical impulse, strongly encoded, but nevertheless legible, on the point of intervening in social happenings with a critique of civilization. It leads modern consciousness of technology and domination ultimately ab absurdum. Perhaps existential ontology can be robbed of much in its potential gloominess, robbed of much of its potential gloominess when it is understood as a philosophical Eulenspiegel game. It pretends all kinds of things to people in order to get them into a position where they no longer allow themselves to be deceived. It pretends to be frightfully unyielding in order to communicate the simplest things. I call it the kinicism of ends. 
inspired by the kinesism of ends, life that has learned the coldness of producing, ruling and destroying through the cynicism of means, could become warm again for us. The critique of instrumental reason presses for its completion as a critique of cynical reason. Its chief task is to loosen Heidegger's pathos and break its tight hold on the mere consciousness of death. Authenticity. If the expression is to have any meaning at all, is experienced by us rather in love and sexual intoxication, in irony and laughter, creativity and responsibility, meditation and ecstasy. In this release, that existential individual, Einziger, who believes it's most intimately genuine, eigenst, possession is its own death disappears. Yeah. I'll read that sentence again without the parentheses. In this release, that existential individual who believes its most intimately genuine possession is its own death disappears. At the summit of potentiality we experience not only the end of the world and lonely death, but even more the demise of the ego and its surrender to the most communal world. Admittedly, death overshadowed philosophical fantasy when the world wars, and uh, between the world wars, and claimed the rights to the first night with the kinicism of ends for itself, at least in philosophy. However, it does not shed a good light on the relationship of existential philosophy to real existence when only one's own death occurs to it, when it is asked what it has to say about real life. Ultimately, it says that it has nothing to say, and to this end it must write nothing with a capital N. This paradox characterises the enormous movement of thought in Sein und Zeit. Such a great wealth of concepts was hardly ever employed before to convey a content so poor in the mystical sense. The work beseeches the reader with a lofty call to authentic existence, but veils itself in silence when one wants to ask, how then? And only, the only, and to be sure, fundamental answer that can be drawn out of it must be read, deciphered, in the foregoing sense, consciously. That is no longer a concrete morality that instructs us to do that is no longer a concrete morality that instructs us as to what to do and what not to do. But if the philosopher is no longer able to give directives, he can still give an urgent suggestion to be authentic. Thus you can do what you like, you can do what you must, but do it in a way that you can remain intensely conscious of what you are doing. Moral amoralism, the last possible word of existential ontology to ethics. It seems that the ethos of conscious life would be the only ethos that can maintain itself in the nihilistic currents of modernity, because it is basically not an ethos. It does not even fulfil the function of a substitute morality of the kind in utopias that posit the good in the future and help to relativise the evil on the way there. Those who really think from beyond good and evil will find only one single opposition that is relevant to life. It is at the same time the only one over which we have power stemming from our own existence without idealistic overexertions, namely that between conscious and unconscious deed. If Sigmund Freud, in a famous challenge, put forward the sentence, where it was, ego should become, Heidegger would say, where anyone was, authenticity should become. Authenticity, freely interpreted, would be the state we achieve when we produce a continuum of being conscious in our existence. Only that breaks the spell of being unconscious, under which human life, especially as socialised human life, lives. The distracted consciousness of anyone is condemned to remaining discontinuous, 
impulsively reactive, automatic and unfree. Anyone is the must, as opposed to this conscious authenticity, we provisionally accept this expression, works out our higher quality of awareness. Buddhism speaks about the same thing in comparable phrases. While the anyone ego sleeps, the existence of the authentic self awakes to itself. Those who examine themselves in a state of continual awakeness discover what is to be done for them in their situation beyond morals. How deep Heidegger's systematic moralism reaches <coughs> How deep Heidegger's systematic amoralism reaches is shown in its reinterpretation of the concept of conscience, Gewissen. Heidegger construes, carefully and revolutionarily at the same time, a conscienceless conscience. If through the millennia of European moral history, conscience was held to be an inner authority that tells us what good and evil are, then Heidegger understands it now as an empty conscience that makes no statements. Quoting Sein und Zeit again, the conscience speaks solely and continually in the modus of keeping silent. Again, Heidegger's characteristic figure of thought appears, intensity that says nothing. Beyond good and evil there is only the loud silence, the intensive, non-judgmental consciousness that restricts itself to alertly seeing what the case is. Conscience, once understood as a substantial moral authority, now approaches pure conscious being, Bewusstsein. Morality, as participation in social conventions and principles, only concerns anyone's behaviour. As the domain of the authentic self, there remains only pure, decisive consciousness, vibrating presence. In a sublime line of thought, Heidegger discovers that this conscienceless, conscienceless conscience contains a call to us, a call to be guilty. Guilty of what? No answer. Is authentic living in some way a priori guilty? Is the Christian doctrine of original sin secretly returning here? In that case we would have only apparently taken leave of moralism. If, however, authentic self-being is described as being unto death, then the thought suggests itself that this call to be guilty produces an existential connection between one's own still being alive and the death of others. Life as causing to die. Authentically living persons are those who understand themselves as survivors, as those whom death has just passed over, and who conceive of the time it will take for a renewed, definitive encounter with death as a postponement. Heidegger's analysis, in essence, penetrates into this most extreme boundary zone of amoral reflection. That he is conscious of standing on explosive ground is revealed by his question, calling on others to be guilty, is that not an incitement to do evil? Could there be an authenticity in which we show ourselves as the decisive doers of evil? Just as the fascist cited Nietzsche's beyond good and evil, in order to do evil emphatically in the world. Heidegger recoils from this consequence. The amoralism of conscienceless conscience is not meant as a call to do evil, he assures us. At least, the Heidegger of 1927 is worried by this vague premonition. But in 1933 he misses the moment of truth, and in this way he let himself be deluded by the activistic decisionistic and heroic husks of slogans of the Hitler movement. The politically naive Heidegger believed he had found in fascism a politics of authenticity and permitted, unsuspecting as only a German university professor could be, a projection of his philosophy onto the national movement. 
However, it should be noted that Heidegger, with respect to his central philosophical achievement, would still not be a man of the right, even if he had said still more politically muddled things than he actually did. For, with his, as I call it, kinicism of ends, he is the first to burst through the utopian moralistic grand theories of the 19th century. With this achievement he remains one of the first in the genealogy of a new and alternative left, of a left that no longer clings to the hybrid constructions and the philosophy of history of the past century, a left that does not, in the style of the dogmatic Marxist grand theory, I prefer this expression to the word Weltanschauung, see itself as the accomplice to the world spirit. A left that has not sworn allegiance to the dogmatics of industrial development without ifs and buts. A left that revises the narrow-minded materialist tradition that burdens it. A left that not only assumes that others must die for one's own cause, but lives with the insight that the living can only rely on themselves. A left that in no way still clings to the naive belief that socialization would be the wonder cure for the maladies of modernity. Without knowing it, and for the most part, even without wanting to know it, in this country even with an outraged resoluteness not to recognise it, the new left is an existential left. A neo left. I risk the expression, a Heideggerian left. This is, particularly in the land of critical theory, which has hung an almost impenetrable taboo on the fascist ontologist, a rather piquant discovery. But who has exhaustively and rigorously investigated the processes of repulsion between the existential tendencies and left Hegelian critical social research? Is there not a wealth of hidden similarities and analogies between Adorno and Heidegger? What grounds are there for a striking refusal to communicate with one another? Who could say which of the two had formulated the more melancholy science? And Diogenes? Did his existential ontological adventure pay off for him? Has his lantern found people? Has he succeeded in instilling the unspeakably simple in our heads? I think he himself doubts it. He will consider whether he should not have whether he should not give up the enterprise of philosophy altogether makes no headway against the sad complicatedness of circumstances. The strategy of collaborating in order to change entangles the changer in the collective melancholy. In the end, those who were the more fully alive are only sadder, and it could hardly be otherwise. Diogenes probably will resign one day from his professorship. Soon after, we will find a notice on the bulletin board saying that Professor X's lectures are cancelled until further notice. Rumour has it that he was seen in an army surplus store where he bought himself a sleeping bag. He was last reported seen sitting on a garbage bin, pretty drunk and giggling to himself like someone whose head is not quite in order. <laughs>